Maybe we can finish today. Yes, I was liaising with um, um, His Grace Ojeshwari Prabhu and he mentioned that the exams would be on the 12th of June. Okay. So that gives us that gives us about two weeks to complete the revision prior to the exams <laughs> and to complete the open exams, open book uh, assessments, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a lot of time. Yes. Mm. Anyway, let's see how it goes today. I didn't finish chapter 11, so we have a few verses to finish chapter 11, and then we'll go into chapter 12. So we can begin. Om Marandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Shremati Bhakti Vedanta Swamaniti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Desha Recording in progress Vanchakalpa Tarubhyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhai Evacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Sade Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we're uh, continuing with chapter 11. We didn't quite complete the final section of chapter 11 in the last class. So we just have this last section, just a few verses remaining here in chapter 11. It, and, but it's an important part of the chapter. The last two verses are very significant. So it's good we begin the class today with this part. All right, so here's text number 52. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, My dear Arjuna, this form of mine you're now seeing is very difficult to behold. Even the demigods are ever seeking the opportunity to see this form, which is so dear. So, Sudur Darshyam, the very special form of the Lord. So Arjuna was blessed, he was able to see it, but even the demigods, they can't see it. And we're not talking about the universal form. This is actually the form of Krishna, the two-armed form, the very special form of Krishna. From Prabhupada's purport, oh, maybe someone would like to read. Now here, the word Sudarshanam darsam, is used, indicating that Krishna's two-handed form is still more confidential. One may be able to see the universal form of Krishna by adding a little tinge of devotional service to various activities like penances, Vedic study, and philosophical speculation. It may be possible, but without a tinge of bhakti, one cannot see. That has already been explained. Still beyond that universal form, the form of Krishna with two hands is still more difficult to see, even for demigods like Brahma and Lord Shiva. Thank you, Prabhu. So, Prabhupada is emphasizing to us how fortunate Arjuna was that he was able to see Krishna in this two-handed form. Okay, then going ahead, just jumping a little bit from 52 up to 54, and we have this very important verse, a point which is emphasized throughout Bhagavad Gita, 
and the importance of bhakti, the importance of devotional service, that it's only by devotional service that Krishna can actually be understood. So this is a, a nice verse which you might like to remember. Bhaktiya vayanyaya shakya aham evam vidorjuna gyatam drishtam cha tadvena praveshtam cha parantapa. My dear Arjuna, only by undivided devotional service can I be understood as I am standing before you and can thus be seen directly. Only in this way can you enter into the mysteries of my understanding. So the mysteries of understanding Krishna, certainly mysterious. We you know so many people have their different opinions about Krishna. The only way he can actually be understood is by devotion. They have to render devotional service. And this point is emphasized in the final verse of this 11th chapter, which is also a very important verse. Mat karma krin mat paramo mat bhakta sangha varjitaha nirvaira sarva bhuteshu ya samam iti pandava. My dear Arjuna, he who engages in my pure devotional service, free from contamination of fruitive activities and philosophical speculation, he who works for me, who makes me the supreme goal of his life, and who is friendly to every living being, he certainly comes to me. So this is an important verse. Five points are mentioned here by Lord Krishna. These five points in the one verse are emphasized. We want to go to Krishna. We want to be sure to get out of this world of birth and death. Here's the qualifications. Right? Prabhupada writes in the purport. Did someone read? Big Anyone who wants to approach the Supreme of all the personalities of Godhead on the Krishna planet in the spiritual sky and be intimately connected with the Supreme Personality, Krishna, must take this Parvana as stated by the Supreme Himself. Therefore, this verse is considered to be the essence of the Bhagavad Gita. Hare Krishna. Hmm. So, Prabhupada is the essence of Bhagavad Gita. Five points are going to be mentioned. Here's some of them. Go ahead, Prabhu, keep reading. Krishna herein gives Arjuna high powerful instruction on how to render pure devotional service. By executing these five instructions, a devotee can be carried to the uh, Lord. Srila Prabhupada discusses each instruction in his purport. First one, the bhakti must be performed purely madhvakta. The devotee must fully engaged in the nine process of devotional service. The only goal is Krishna's service. This is no desire for attainment in this world. All right, so this is pure devotion. Madhbhakta, right? You know from your study of nectar of devotion. Have you already studied nectar of devotion? No, Madhash. Oh, you haven't studied it yet. Okay. Anyway, you'll be studying it. So there the pure devotion is described. Anya vilasita sunyam jnana karma janavritam anukuyena krishna nushilam bhakti uttamam. The devotional service should be pure, it shouldn't be mixed with material desires. The desire must be to serve Krishna favorably. As Prabhupada says here, no desire for attainments in this world. Our only goal is Krishna's service. And so that's a very important point, right? So it must be pure devotion. That's the first point. Go ahead, Prabhu. Second, bhakti must be free from karma and jnana, sangha varjita. A devotee should not associate with the persons 
who are against Krishna and he should not be uh, become attracted uh, to anything but pure devotion. A devotee at the same time should not be envious of those who are in Mikal because the karma of such persons has awarded him that uh, mentally uh, devotees should remain disintegrated, uh, sorry, dis, uh, disangled from uh, such a person of karma. Third point. The work of bhaktas must be for Krishna, mat karma krita. A devotee should use his energy fully in Krishna's service, while remaining detached from the fruits of his work. Fourth point. Krishna must be the goal of life, mat paraha, mat paramaha. The devotee should remain unattracted to the both heavenly and impersonal destinations. Fifth point. The devotee must friendly to all, he must compassionate to desire to give Krishna consciousness this is from the surrender to me by Bhurijan Prabhu. All right. So these are the five points which we get from this verse. They're all there in the original verse. And Prabhupada's also mentioned these things in the purport. Mad karma krit, working for Krishna. Mm? So remaining detached from the fruit of work. We use our energy fully in Krishna's service. That's the third point. And then Krishna must be the goal of life, unattracted to both heavenly and impersonal destinations. Devotee simply wants Krishna's service. Wherever Krishna puts us, that it's not a problem. The devotee just wants to be engaged in service to Krishna. And friendly to all. Not, he must be compassionate. We want to give Krishna consciousness to others. The more, the more we give Krishna consciousness, the more we get it. So giving Krishna consciousness is a way to increase our own Krishna consciousness. So if a devotee is thinking how to give Krishna to others, that's a very good sign. And then the, the second point here, there's a few points which brought up. It, main point being that, that bhakti should be pure without desire for fruitive activity or karma or philosophical speculation, gana. So a devotee has no desire to enjoy the material world and he doesn't desire to enjoy liberation either. And a devotee should not be envious. And even someone is envious of Krishna, or is envious of devotees, well, we should tolerate this person. Stated here, we should remain, we shouldn't get involved in his karma. If we develop bad feelings towards people, that's not good for our devotional service. So we have to be disentangled, keep away from people's karma. If we start to do things, bad things, or make trouble, avoid them and so on, it, it will bring problems for us. Of course, we should avoid them, try to keep away, and that way then we can avoid getting entangled in their karma. People have their own karma. Some people's karma takes them away from Krishna. They don't have the, any piety. And so we shouldn't envy, we shouldn't get involved with them. Leave them. Okay, in summary, this is from Prabhupada's purport. Someone can read. It is in summary, the universal form of Krishna, which is a temporary manifestation and the form of time which diverse everything and even the form of Vishnu, four-handed, have all been exhibited by Krishna. Thus, Krishna is the origin of all these manifestations. It is not that Krishna is a manifestation of the original Vishwarupa or Vishnu. Krishna is the origin of all forms. There are hundreds and thousands of Vishnus, but, the, but for a devotee, no form of Krishna is important but the original form, two-handed Shama Sundara. In the Brahma Samhita, it is stated that those who are attached to the Shama Sundara form of Krishna in love and devotion can see him always within the heart and cannot see anything else. 
one should understand, therefore, that the purport of this 11th chapter is that the form of Krishna is essential and supreme. Oh, thank you very much, Manaji. Yes, so Prabhupada's purport is very clear and it establishes clearly the supreme position of Krishna's two-hand form as Shamsunda. But in this chapter many things were explained. We heard about the Kala Rup, and then Arjuna also saw the four-handed form. The, all different things were there in this eleventh chapter. But the important point is Krishna is supreme. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. All right. So everybody's okay with that. Any questions on the eleventh chapter before we go on to chapter twelve? Okay, if there are no questions, we'll go ahead to chapter 12. Hmm. What is this? Oh, we did this one, right? mentioned in this verse uh, that they saw the Vishparupa. Who was it? The, the, uh, the Asuras. Asuras. So it's a little confusing always uh, whenever I means whenever we think of the upper planetary system uh, my mind at least just goes towards the, uh, you know, elevated souls like that. Of course, they must have done some karma to have gone to an elevated platform, but they are still asuras. But uh, I could understand that much, but uh, when when I was reading that uh, even the Vishwarupa was seen by the asuras, I was really confused again. Uh, it was supposed to be uh, shown only to some specific... Uh, uh, Nice devotees, I thought, so I didn't understand when uh, it was shown to the Asuras also. Does it, where does it say that? All the various manifestations. Verse, verse, verse 22. Verse 22. Verse 22. 11th chapter, 22. Yes, yes. Yes, they're beholding you in wonder. How do we understand? Always, Maharaj, there is a confusion as to who are the Asuras, who are the uh, 
Taithyas, Tanavas, so many uh, definitions of uh, various uh, personalities. So that is something which is very. Asuras or Daityas? <laughs> yes, mentioned there, yeah. Well, it's mentioned that the demigods, they were taking shelter of the Lord and crying, please protect us. And the sages were begging the Lord, let there be peace, good fortune and well-being for all. So, uh, Probably Maharaj, is, is this uh, that understanding that uh, they are entering into the uh, uh, this form, that's the reason why they are beholding you in wonder, that's what is written? Well, yes, they're seeing, they're seeing Krishna's form, they're seeing this form of time, right? This is Kala Rup, this is the beginning of the description of Krishna's Kala Rup, his form. So, yeah, it's describing this... Uh, particular feature of the Lord, blazing fire coming from the mouth, burning the entire universe. And so this is the description of the Kala Rup. And Krishna allowed the demigods to see that, and not only the demigods, but as you see also the demons are also mentioned there. So many, the great sages and Asuras, the Yakshas, various manifestations of Lord Shiva, they're all beholding this form in wonder. So, how to understand, how can we understand these? Krishna, this was a special arrangement of Lord Krishna that he allowed at this particular time, he allowed these different personalities to actually see it. It mentions the perfected demigods, perfected demigods. So it's like not all the demigods, but perfected demigods. And when it mentions the others, the Gandharvas, the Yakshas, the Asuras, we're not told exactly, is it all of them? Or is it just a few, not so clear. And the Achar, there's no real comment on this verse. The acharyas just seem to, they, they go by it, they don't give any real comment. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I was thinking that because this is a material manifestation, so all the living entities are included in this universal form because they're all existing. Oh yes, we're also there. <laughs> we're also yes, within right. the universal form. So are the Asuras part and parcel of Krishna? Yes, of course, they're also part and parcel of Krishna, but still we were, we were told that, you know, not so easy to see this universal form. Arjuna had to be given divine eyes, right? He was given, well, not particularly divine eyes, but you could say heavenly eyes. Actually, uh, actually, in the, the Vistha, actually, in the purport of given by the Balta Vidya Vasana, actually, in the his commentary in text 23, uh, he had written that this verse concludes the description of the three world be, uh, being agitated on singing the form. That means everybody in the three world, they are watching the Vishwaru. This form was ferocious uh, with many teeth. The rest of this verse is clear. The last phrase, the Tataham, is uh, connected to the next verse of the subject. That means from the first line, it is a, it is given that the, the description of this three world being agitated on seeing this form. That means everybody in the three world, they are watching the Vishwarupa form. Oh, As per the Maltha Vidya Vishana commentary. Also, Srila Prabhupada in purport of text 20 mentions in the paragraph, first paragraph, it appears that not only did Arjun see this universal form of the Lord, but others in other planetary system saw it also. Yes, right. Okay. 
So this was the mercy of Krishna. Krishna allowed them to see it. As we heard later, as we just read this morning, uh, that people could see the universal form, but they were not able to see Krishna's two-handed form. The two-handed form is more confidential. Yes, ma'am. So, even the, the, the asura, oh, as you say, uh, everybody could see the universal form. So, asuras and suras, everyone's seeing it. By the grace of Krishna, Krishna was revealing to everyone. Not everyone, of course, could understand what That's is right. this, what is it, yeah. Everyone, people, many, they're filled with fear, even Arjuna is fear. That's the emotion which was evoked on seeing the universal form. Okay, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not able to really guide you very much on that, but as we hear, everyone could see the universal form, the three worlds. And certainly they mentioned many people, the Yakshas and Gandharvas, and then all people on earth, Arjuna's seeing it. I don't know, everyone on the battlefield, did they, they, you say, the Prabhu said, the commentary says that all living entities in the three worlds could see it. So three worlds, Bur, Bhuva, Swa, that they're all able to see the, this form, Kalaru. Okay, we'll go ahead. Are you able to see the PowerPoint? Yes, my Yes, my You can see it, huh? Okay, good. All right, so lesson 10. Qualities which endear one to Krishna. This is the title for this. We're on chapter number 12. All right. Devotional service. Here's the review of chapter 11. It began with Arjuna's request and Krishna's description of the universal form. And then we had Sanjay's description of Arjuna's vision. Sanjay was speaking. He hadn't spoken since the first chapter, but he described Arjuna's vision. And then we have Krishna's uh, response. Arjuna was asking, who are you? And Krishna said, time I am. You just become an instrument in my service. And then Arjuna's prayers. And then the final section about pure devotees being able to see Krishna's two-armed form. The very special form of Krishna, very confidential for the pure devotees. So that was chapter 11. Now chapter 12, we want to look at the connection. The Bhagavad Gita's middle set of six chapters began with Krishna discussing bhakti and Arjuna wants it to end in the same way. After witnessing Krishna's awesome universal form, Arjuna wishes to confirm his own position as a devotee who works for Krishna, as opposed to a jnani who renounces work. And so this is the point, about well, two points are made actually, you could say. First point being that Krishna began chapter 7 by discussing bhakti. We know at the end of chapter, five, chapter 6, Krishna had spoken the yoga ladder and that bhakti was at the top of the yoga ladder. So then chapter 7 began with some discussion on bhakti and Arjuna wants this section, which is 7 to 12, that it, it began with bhakti, it should end with bhakti. The first six chapters, chapters 1 to 6, were mainly on karma yoga. And the last six are more on Jnana Yoga. But this middle portion, chapters 7 to 12, is more emphasizing Bhakti. 
and it began with bhakti and it should end with bhakti. And then another point which comes up is Arjuna wants to confirm his own position as a devotee, as opposed to a jnani who renounces work, because seeing the universal form, it may inspire people to renounce work. So should we just simply give up work or should we work for Krishna? Of course, we heard in that verse, the, end, the last verse of the 11th chapter, that we should work for Krishna. So Arjuna wants to confirm his position as a devotee, that he should be working for Krishna and he shouldn't be thinking about renouncing work. Arjuna is always thinking, you know, renouncing work, be a jnani. But Krishna wants him to work. Bhagavad Gita encourages work, not idleness. All right, then the objectives, what we want to cover, we will see there's a progression from Varnashram Dharma to Krishna Consciousness in verses 8 up to 12. We want to look at that progression. And then we also want to see some examples of devotees possessing qualities which endear one to Krishna. We'll hear these qualities described in this chapter, verses 13 to 19. This is a short chapter, it's just like 19, 20 verses, so not a very big chapter, but important chapter, certainly. It's emphasizing bhakti yoga. And we'll try to give an overview. Maybe we could do that now, the chapter 7 to 12, identifying significant sections. No, well, we can do that because there's, if we want to identify significant sections as well, then it will take more time. Anyway, we will look at that as we go on. The links between the chapters, not very difficult, but the significant sections we should pick up. All right, so chapter begins with the first section that bhakti is superior to impersonalism. Impersonalism is discussed in this section. There's always, we're always trying to compete against impersonalism. There's always this challenge. Then, of course, this was one of the important points which Lord Chaitanya took from the teachings of Madhva Acharya. The complete, the complete refutal of impersonalism. The Madhva Acharya people, they're very powerful, they're very strong on that, to defeat the impersonalists. Because Shankaracharya, of course, he was very prominent, and Madhvacharya was preaching against the impersonal philosophy of Shankaracharya. So they had a lot of good arguments on that. So the question comes up. Oh, well, the, the question is actually asked in the first verse, right? It's the first verse which is actually the question. We have Arjuna. Uh, who are con which are considered to be more perfect? Those who are always properly engaged in your devotional service or those who worship the impersonal Brahman, the unmanifested? So Arjuna wants to confirm that he's doing the right thing. That's understandable. We do something, just like when we come into Krishna Consciousness, we want to be sure that we're doing the right thing. And so Arjuna wants to remove his doubts. So who is more perfect? Somebody who is always engaged in devotional service or somebody who worships the impersonal Brahman, the unmanifested? People are more attracted sometimes to the impersonal aspect. 
it's difficult for them to conceive of the personal aspect. Okay, so these are the three sections of the twelfth chapter. Bhakti, superior to impersonalism. Here's Arjuna's question. The impersonal Brahman, the unmanifested, it sounds more spiritual, you know, to be engaged in devotional service. Oh, you know, it doesn't sound very inviting, but to worship the impersonal Brahman, the unmanifested, we think, oh, that's spiritual. No oh, chanting Hare Krishna, no. You know, some people, they think like that. They have that conception. Someone can read for us, please. So, factually, there are two classes of transcendentalists. Now, Arjun is trying to settle the question of which process is easier and which of the classes is most perfect. In other words, he is clarifying his own position because he is attached to the personal form of Lord Krishna. He is not attached to the impersonal Brahman. He wants to know whether his position is secure. Hare Krishna. Mm, right. So then Krishna's response here, immediately Krishna gives a very clear response. Right. Someone please read. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, Those who fix their minds on my personal form and are always engaged in this worshipping me with great and transcendental faith are considered by me to be the most perfect. Most perfect. So there's no humming and hawing, oh, maybe this, maybe... Uh, uh, Lord Krishna is very clear about it. Those who fix their minds on my personal form and are always engaged in worshipping me with great and transcendental faith, they are most perfect, right? So, tame yuta tamo, tame yukta atman mataha. They have, they're the best. Nitya yukta upasati. So, this is the Lord Krishna's a very clear statement about this. Yes, someone read. In answers to Arjuna's question, Krishna clearly says that he who concentrates upon his personal form and who worships him with faith and devotion is to be considered most perfect in yoga. For one in such Krishna consciousness, there are no material activities because everything is done for Krishna. A pure devotee is constantly engaged. Sometimes he chants, sometimes he hears or reads books about Krishna, or sometimes he cooks prasadam, or goes to the marketplace to purchase something for Krishna, or sometimes he washes the temple or the dishes, whatever he does, he does not let a single moment pass without devotion, without devoting his activities to Krishna. Such action is in full samadhi. Mm -hmm. So this is Krishna consciousness, always engaged in Krishna's service. Of course, not everyone's so fortunate that they can do like that every day. Most people have to work, they have jobs and they have so many other things to do and children to take care of and so many activities. But somehow we have to try to use every moment for devoting ourselves in activities to Krishna. So Prabhupada said, that is actually samadhi. That is samadhi, fixed mind, constant service to Krishna. And then Krishna describes about the impersonalist. And this is a verse which is often quoted also because it describes it the, the position of the impersonalists. Klesha. Klesha means difficulties, troubles. Klesho dikataras tesham avyakta sakta chaitasam 
Avyakta hi gatir dukam dehavadbir avapyate. For those whose minds are attached to the unmanifested, the avyakta, the impersonal feature of the Supreme, advancement is very troublesome, klesha. To make progress in that discipline is always difficult for those who are embodied. And so because we have the body, because we are in a body, it's difficult for us to contemplate something which is without a body, the unmanifested, the impersonal feature. Very difficult for us to contemplate, to fix our mind on that. Mm. Because we, are bod we have bodies, so how can we understand something which doesn't have a body? We don't have experience of this. And if we're attached to this idea, this unmanifested, impersonal feeling, then advancement is a lot of trouble. Hmm. Srila Prabhupada's explanation. Would you like someone to read, please? The group of transcendentalists who follow the path of the inconceivable, unmanifested, impersonal feature of the Supreme Lord are called Jnana Gyan, Yogis. And persons who are in full Krishna consciousness engaged in devotional service to the Lord are called Bhakti Yogis. Now here the difference between the Jnana Gyan Yoga and Bhakti Yoga is definitely expressed. The process of Jnana Yoga, although ultimately bringing one to the same goal, is very troublesome. Whereas the path of Bhakti Yoga, the process of being in direct service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is easier and is natural for the embodied soul. Thank you, Maharaji. Yes. So the Jnana Yogis, they're fond of the inconceivable, the unmanifested, impersonal feature. For, for the jnana yogi, their goal is liberation. They simply want mukti, moksha. So, we know from the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna has described, Bahunam Gyanmanam Ante Gyana Vam Mam Right, yeah, after many births and deaths, one who is actually in knowledge will surrender to me. But such a soul is very rare. So the Jnana Yogis, they don't make progress very easily. We said, m after many births and deaths. So it's taking them a long time they, and with great difficulty they will come to understand. And if their knowledge, when it becomes perfect, then Vasudev Sarvamiti, and they will surrender to Krishna, knowing that Krishna Vasudev is everything. So that's Jnana Yoga, trying to get out from the material world, giving up so many things, so many attachments of the material world. But Bhakti Yoga, as Prabhupada describes here, is easier and it's natural. Because what is Bhakti Yoga? Bhakti Yoga is simply, as Prabhupada described, cooking and cleaning, and going to market and worshipping, doing all of these different activities. That is Bhakti Yoga. It's very easy, very natural, it's not troublesome, but jnana yoga is a lot of trouble to make advancement very slowly. Okay, and then here you can see comparison between the impersonalist and the personalist, their realization. The impersonalist they want to realize the Brahman. For them, the Brahman is the Supreme. But for the devotee, we want to know Bhagavan. So that's a big difference there. And then, 
when we mention also, they understand that the Brahman is nirguna, without qualities. But we say the Brahman is saguna, full with form, qualities, etc. Saguna Brahman. The Lord is Saguna, and the Brahman is inconceivable, and we say Bhagavan, the Supreme Brahman, he possesses inconceivable potencies. And then Brahman is all-pervading, yes we agree, all-pervading by energies and as super-soul. And that way, all pervading. The Brahman is unchanging, fixed, and immovable. But the feature of the Lord as Bhagavan is unchanging, fixed, and immovable. No difference, right? They say Brahman is like that. We say Bhagavan is like that. We cannot conceive, the impersonalists say, we cannot conceive any opulence because of the lack of activity. But we say Bhagavan is possessor of all opulences in full. So you can see the difference. The risk of not realizing the absolute truth at the end, if you take the impersonal path, realize Brahman, is a risk. You may not be successful. But in Bhakti Yoga, success is guaranteed. Nothing is lost. A little advancement made saves us from the greatest danger. Right? So with Bhakti Yoga, we're assured that gradually we will get success. And then finally, may realize the eternal and knowledgeable aspects of the original nature partial realization, the eternal and knowledgeable aspects of the origin. But the devotee will realize eternity, knowledge and bliss, it, because Bhagavan realization includes also realization of Brahman and Paramatma. So when you compare the two, you can see the superiority of Bhakti Yoga, the personal process. And here's further comparison, the impersonal process based on, we have to meditate on the formless, but we meditate on the deity. Meditate on the formless, that's how do you do that? Difficult to imagine something which has no form, but we meditate on the deity, it's very pleasing, very easy. Their process is beyond the senses, but we say senses can perceive the deity and the sound of mantras, so we engage the senses. They say, oh, it's beyond the senses, stop the senses. Must understand Brahman through Upanishads, etc. So, they say you have to learn the language, which is Sanskrit, so it takes many years of study, and then you still have to speculate on the meaning. But we say simply understand Krishna through devotional service, chanting. Long practice makes it difficult. If you do the, the impersonal process, then many years practicing, and the longer you do the impersonal path, the more difficult it becomes for you to take up bhakti. But bhakti yoga is very easy and natural. So, so much trouble with the impersonal path, but in the personal path, there's no trouble. The, even the miseries are removed by the grace of Krishna. Depends all on our own endeavor, but in Krishna consciousness, Krishna delivers the devotee from maya. Right? We depend on the mercy of Krishna. It's Krishna who delivers the devotee. We simply engage in his service. But every in the jnana yoga process, impersonal path, it all depends on our own endeavor. 
how intense you perform to come to the same level of Brahman. All right? How do we, oh, that we ask that question there? Uh, Krishna delivers the devotee from Maya. Why? This is explained here in this verse. Text number, uh, this, this verse, an important verse. Right? Krishna is the deliverer of the devotee. Text number six and seven. But those who worship me, giving up all their activities unto me, and being devoted to me without deviation, engaged in devotional service, always meditating upon me, having fixed their minds upon me, O son of Prita, for them I am the swift deliverer from the ocean of birth and death. So Krishna delivers the devotee from the ocean of birth and death. It's not that we do it, but it's Krishna comes. You can see in the, in the illustration, Lord Krishna comes on the back of Garuda and he picks us up out of that ocean of material existence and takes us back home, back to God. Of course, we have to be worthy. We have to worship Krishna and we have to give up dedicate our activities to Krishna, always meditating and fix our minds on Krishna, right? So be fixed, we have to really fix ourselves on Krishna. Then, Tishamaham samudarta mrichu samsara sagarat. Krishna said, I am the deliverer from the ocean of birth and death. So that's what we want. We want to get free from the ocean of birth and death. All right, someone read. Bhagavad Gita Purport 12.6-7 Similarly, a devotee does not need to endeavor to transfer himself by yoga practice to other planets. Rather, the Supreme Lord, by His great mercy, comes at once, riding on His bird carrier Garuda, Garuda, and at once delivers the devotee from material existence. Although a man who has fallen in the ocean may struggle very hard and may be very expert in swimming, he cannot save himself. But if someone comes and picks him up from the water, then he is easily rescued. Similarly, the Lord picks up the devotee from this material existence. One simply has to practice the easy process of Krishna consciousness and fully engage himself in devotional service. Hare Krishna. Okay, thank you, Manaji. So, fallen in the ocean, we can't expect to just swim. One of the things I was told that if, we, if it happens to us that we fall in the ocean, don't try to swim because it, it, you'll be so far away, you'll never make it, you'll never get to the land. So they encourage you, just, just stay where you are, just stay there in the ocean and hope that somebody's going to come by and pick you up. Because if you start swimming, you'll soon get tired and you'll soon realize that you're very, very far away from the shore. And so, you can see here, Prabhupada is saying the same thing. We cannot save ourselves, even though we may be very expert in swimming. But, if somebody comes, then they can rescue us. So, we're really dependent on the mercy of the Lord or His devotees, that they will come and deliver us. All right, a little exercise, discussion. Consider Srila Prabhupada's example of dependency on Krishna. How did he exemplify this? Give some concrete examples. And then Srila Prabhupada's emphasis was on surrender to the instructions of the parampara and on confidence in Krishna looking after our welfare. Identify examples of how we may sometimes fail to follow this. 
So we'll do this in groups. How many people do we have here today? Sixteen, Guru Maharaj. How many? Sixteen, one six. Oh, sixteen, okay. So we can have four groups of four. How much time do you think you need? Ten minutes? Ten minutes. Yes, okay. Hare Krishna Mataji Subhadra.
Yes, they, they are all coming back, Guru. Okay. Sorry, we took a few extra minutes. Yeah, you did. Yeah. It was very nice discussions. <laughs> really? No, oh, good. All right, let's hear then from the first group. What did you discuss? What were some examples of Prabhupada's uh, dependency on Krishna? Guru Maharaj, we have another three more participants who have not, who are coming in right now. So okay. just give us another minute. If okay. It's okay, Guru Maharaj. Yeah. Are we group one? I can't remember the groupings, Mataji. I just randomly, uh, you know, assign the numbers. So, yeah, it doesn't matter. Guru, Guru Smarana Mataji's group can go first. Please carry on, Guru Smarana Mataji. Shall I speak or what? Oh. Hare Krishna. Our group this, uh, consisted of our Mahapandit Dayanubi Prabhu, Amar Nitai Prabhu, Amar Nitai Prabhu, Dipshika Mataji, Jagriti Mataji and myself. I did personally ask Dayanubi Prabhu to speak but somehow the other I am speaking so please bear with me. We discussed on how Shri Prabhupada was so dependent on Krishna when he travelled to the west in the Jaladuta. We are saying that he didn't have any money, nor did he have any manpower, nor did he know anyone, but he was so dependent on Krishna and Guru that he was able to do so much. He engaged everyone and involved everyone in their service, uh, took their services and managed to spread Krishna conscious all over the world. The other point we have noted was that Srila Prabhupada had two heart attacks even in the boat. That also didn't um, uh, made him um, not to uh, carry on his Guru's order. He was still so dependent on Krishna and Guru. And also we also discussed how he never felt his Guru's absence ever. And in that way, because he always was following his spiritual master's instruction, by doing so, he was able to follow his instruction, which were the foremost is to print books and distribute books. So he started with distributing back to Godhead magazine. And then we can see even till now that is carried on. Other point we noted was that Srila Prabhupada had so much faith on the holy name that he even mentioned that even someone chants their 16 rounds before Mangal Arti, they are guaranteed to go home back to Godhead. And we can also say that Srila Prabhupada has a very strong faith in Krishna and his faith was undivided. He was such a great Acharya. He, he was a good, great teacher in the sense that uh, even though we didn't have any qualification, uh, he made every one of us qualified and he made every one uh, of us understand the highest uh, um, thing that is so difficult to understand just simply by having so much faith in the in the holy name and Lord Sri Krishna. Srila Prabhupada's books itself are so powerful. And we discussed that the many people just by reading Srila Prabhupada's book, not knowing anything about Krishna, became so Krishna conscious. Now coming on to the second part, okay, whereby okay, we let, may... Let's just stop there, okay. Madhiji. I think okay, we'll, we'll, sorry, we'll, let, sorry. let's hear any other group would like to offer something about dependency on Krishna. Someone else? We yes. Hear, like to hear. Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, Maharaj, uh, like uh, as a small example, like uh, we also thought the same thing, like uh, Guru Mahara Ma Ma Mataji was saying. But one more example, when uh, there was a war going on between US and Japan, uh, there was some news like uh, they are going to drop one bomb in Kolkata from Japan uh, team. Like uh, in that case, like uh, everyone is like uh, like uh, leaving the Kolkata, but uh, Prabhupada was going on the streets and chanting. There we can see how much confidence and how much uh, uh, dependency is having on the Krishna. We can able to see a kind of example. 
Okay. Thank you, Prabhu. Very nice. Yes, anyone else can offer something about dependency on Krishna, which we have not heard? Hare, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, I just wanted to say about the, the Juhu land battle as well. Uh, there was such a big battle and uh, the deity was there, it was kept in a shed and Shri Prabhupada mentioned to the deity that I, please remain here except the... Hare Krishna. I think this video is paused. Uh, one more thing which we would also like to add was that uh, uh, it was seen that uh, when literally he was uh, bankrupt, means his business got uh, flopped and it didn't work, but he was just not disturbed. So he was so having full faith in Krishna that, uh, you know, Krishna will uh, take us ahead and uh, I don't need to worry that I don't have anything. And even actually, even the Jalabhita when he was traveling, uh, he had no money and his age and health did not permit. And uh, uh, means he was so dependent on Krishna that uh, even, uh, even when we reached there, he hardly knew anyone. So full dependency on Krishna and we were also discussing as to how uh, uh, means he believed that uh, we are all puppets in Krishna's hands and uh, he says that uh, Please make me dance, and uh, we are uh, no. But at even at one more place, he was saying that uh, even though I've written all these books, he reads his own translations and he reads his own purports. Um, he says that I was just an instrument. Lord made me write the books, so he okay. giving the credit to uh, his guru and Krishna. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, Maharaj. Yes. Um, I, uh, I was also thinking like how uh, he turned to tell neophyte people into devotees. He gave them the formal dating principles, the chanting of 16 rounds. He made them do deity worship. Like he took such a big risk, you know, by bringing totally new people to do worship uh, like that. He did totally dependent on Krishna to have the qualified devotee okay. to do such. Yes, nice. Thank you. Okay, let's go on to the second part of the question. That we wanted some, some examples of how sometimes we may fail to have confidence in Krishna looking after us. Or we, we don't follow the instructions of the parampara. So, would someone like to open on this? How we sometimes fail to follow? the parampara, and we don't show confidence in Krishna, we don't have that same faith? I think uh, we just go many times uh, with a doubt. Yes, uh, we are supposed to follow the instructions we want to follow, but somewhere we have a kind of doubt whether um, somewhere, unless I act, then uh, nothing is going to happen. So sometimes we go into the acting mode and we think again we are the doers, so we get caught very easily in that uh, Think that uh, then we become the doers and we are the doers kind, then it's because of me that kind of we get entangled by this. Uh, uh, we just don't know when we slip into it, I would say. We're thinking we are the doer, yeah? Yeah. All right. We have some doubt in the words of the Lord which is making us go into this. We don't have complete faith which makes us fall into this trap. Okay. Like, like Prabhupada had so much faith in the words of his uh, spiritual master that he literally he said that you are all English speaking men, go preach in English to the whole world. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has said that it has to reach every town, town and village. So, uh, you know, we have to fulfill what the parampara says. Prabhupada had so much faith that uh, even when many people were discouraging him, he didn't, he was not, uh, shaken by their words. Okay. How about you? How are you doing? Uh, that's what I'm saying. Somewhere I get into this trap of, uh, you know, maybe I should act and I become more like, okay, it's because of me. Then again, I kind of remind myself that I'm not the doer, actually Krishna's the doer. So I get into this trap very fast without my knowledge. Yeah. So if, you, to, if you get uh, if you get good results, then Krishna's the doer. And if the results are not good, then it's your fault, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually, not depend on the results. I'm sure whatever we do for Krishna, even though it might be temporarily not 
we might not be able to see it as good but uh, it will definitely be for good later on i understand so many times why it was first happening like this at that moment okay. maybe we have... okay thank you all right dr guru smarana you have, you have something about this your the second part of the question Okay. In the second part, we discussed that we, as we promised to our Guru at the time of initiation that we will chant 16 rounds. Sometimes um, maybe work related or in a very busy schedule, we may fail to do that. But um, uh, Dipshika Mataji gave us a very nice realization that initially before she got initiated, she was introduced to chanting and she would probably not be so fixed up. But when she got initiated by Jay Pataka Swami Maharaj and, and when Jay Pataka Swami Maharaj gave her initiation and she said that she's going to chant 16 rounds and it gave great pleasure to her spiritual master. And she said that by knowing that if I chant 16 rounds, my guru will be so pleased. And she said, ever since I managed to keep on chanting. No. Uh, Hare Krishna so, Mataji, Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, not initiation Mataji, I first met a Guru, Mahi, Guru Maharaj, so from okay. that time onwards, like, yeah, I am fixed in my chanting. Earlier, my chanting was not consistent, Maharaj, I was doing sometimes, but due to my office pressure and my father's illness, sometimes I will not chant, uh, chant. I was not consistent that enough, but when I met Guru Maharaj, first time, then, yeah, and he, and he was so happy hearing that, yes, I was chanting, so I thought, okay, the, if my chanting is making my Guru Maharaj happy, then yes, I, from that time onwards, I have never failed chanting my 16 rounds daily. Oh, very good, very good. So you keep up your 16 rounds. All right. All right. Yes. Hare Krishna. <coughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna, go ahead. Yeah, uh, as Deep Shikha told, like same for me also, like, Initially, when I started chanting, it was not fixed and other things also like, but when I met with my Guru Maharaj, like it's keeping me whole. I think the best thing is to, for the love for Guru and Gauranga, that is the best thing. Like now I don't need to put any alarm for my Mangalarti or for my chanting because I know somewhere like my Guru Maharaj will be pleased and he became very happy. The love, he showed us the love and mercy he gave me. Like the same thing, the same love. I love him and, and that's because of that love I am keeping like whole. So, because I'm new to Krishna conscious, I don't have much experience. Like, I will not say that I have seen Gauranga or I have seen Krishna, but that's the Guru's love. Whatever he will tell, I'll do. Even like this Bhakti Shastri I'm doing because Guru Maharaj asked, like he was telling in uh, public forum itself, not personally, like we should do Bhakti uh, Shastri, Bhakti Vyabha, like that. And I thought, oh, Guru Maharaj will be pleased like with this, I'll go for it. But other time when any people will say, it will be like excuse for me. No, no, Saturday, Sunday also I am having shifts and all. How will I manage and all? But right now I am managing because Guru Maharaj told. So that's, I think, keeping me hold is that love for my Guru. That's it. That's what I wanted to share. Okay, thank you. Hi. Yes. Yes, Any anyone else like to offer here? Yeshoda Mataji had a point. Yeshoda Mataji, you wanted to say something? Yes, Maharaj, I wanted to say that sometimes we fail to follow this instruction of Shapa because when we are very well materially situated, like we have wealth, we have good education, we have no issues as such, so we sometimes fail to take up to Krishna consciousness seriously. So only when we get a big problem or, or some, of the mercy of Krishna, then we, we will uh, listen to what Prabhupada says on the instruction of the Parampara. So yeah. when we are very much really well situated, sometimes we forget Krishna. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have to be careful that we become more, uh, we have more confidence in our material opulence than in depending on Krishna. When we're materially comfortable, then we don't chant the holy name so well. But when we're in difficulties, then that's the time when we can chant better. Yes. <laughs> Until we are not able to engage ourselves 24 hours in the loving devotion ourselves, Lord and Peter. That is our main failure. Huh, yes. Well, 24 hours, to engage yourself 24 hours in loving service is certainly a challenge. That's a very high level of devotion. So to come to that topmost level, yeah, we certainly may fail to do that. 
will take some time to come to that topmost level to be 24 hours engaged in Krishna's service. But, gradually, we'll hear in this, in this section of the Bhagavad Gita, we're going to hear the progression that if we're not able to fully engage ourselves 24 hours a day, then what should we do? So that, that will be explained. Okay, any other examples about how sometimes we may fail to follow? Maharaj, just... Uh, Go ahead, Prabhu. Maharaj, it's just, uh, just last week, I think, I just saw this uh, very beautiful message from Srila Prabhupada. It's a quote, it came through. Uh, Srila Prabhupada said that, don't be after motor cars, television, of, uh, uh, don't be after these things. Uh, simply chant Hare Krishna eat nicely, prasadam, and go back home, back to Godhead. But I think, you know, in today's day, in these current times, some of, uh, because the Maya is so strong, the devotees are also trying to, you know, have these things as well, like the luxury items that are probably there for the, for the materialistic persons. Yes, right. Yeah, we have to control the mind. <laughs> we have to have confidence that if Krishna wants us to have things, he will arrange it. All right. Yes, Maharajji wanted to say something? Yes, Maharaj, I was saying, uh, Shri Prabhupada also gave emphasis that he has written the books and he was also saying that uh, I can confidently say that all these disciples of mine are so uh, surrendered to me that they will do anything I will ask. The only complaint I have is they don't read my books. Uh -huh. So we are... Okay, so we, we may fail to do the reading. We may fail to read the books regularly, yes. Okay. So, <laughs> we have to read the books, not just only sell them, right? And not just keep them on the bookshelf, we have to read them. So yes. It's, so it's good. You do Bhakti Shastri and go on and do Bhakti by Bab, you read the books more. Okay, very good. Thank you very much for your participation. Now we're going to see the different stages of devotion, all right? We'll make a diagram showing the various stages as they are described in chapter 12, verses 8 to 12. And here you can see the diagram. <laughs> We've done it for you. Can you see? So, you can see uh, Lord Krishna begins his explanation from the topmost level. That's text number 8. In te text number 8, we have the highest level. Lord Krishna said, Just fix your mind upon me, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and engage all your intelligence in me. Thus you will live in me always, without a doubt. So that's not an easy thing to do, to fix your mind on Krishna and all your intelligence and and live, uh, you know, it, it's very, it's the ideal stage. So that is the topmost level, all right? Now, we're not able to do that. So what do we do then? What's the next step down? So then Lord Krishna goes down a step and text number nine describes, My dear Arjuna, O conqueror of wealth, if you cannot fix your mind upon me without deviation, yeah, certainly, probably we have that problem. I don't know about you, all of you, but the mind certainly is it's a problem, it deviates. Then what? Then follow the regulated principles of bhakti yoga and in this way develop a desire to attain me. So what are the regulated principles of bhakti yoga? Yes? You know? Sadha, Sadhu Sangha, like that letter. Sadha, then Sadhu Sangha, Bhajan Kriya, Anarth Maharaj, can you please repeat? 
I'm asking, what are the regulative principles of bhakti yoga? Some, now, sometimes we think, oh, following the four regulative principles, chanting 16 rounds, Waking up for Mangal Arati, doing Tulsi Arati. Yes, uh, right. That's right. Waking up in the morning, bathing and taking, uh, then putting tilak on the body, and then, you know, doing a, go out, collect, collect some flowers and offer Arati to the deities, if you have them. This kind of, and then you have to chant, you have to worship Tulsi, and, you have to uh, read Srimad Bhagavatam, and then cook for Krishna and offer your food to Krishna. So in this way, this is all part of the bhakti yoga. So we should... It should be under the guidance of spiritual master? Well, of course, the, spirit, the spiritual master guides us in this. You know, everyone does this, every spiritual master. Not only spiritual master, but every de devotee, we're all engaged. We have a morning program, right? So we, it's not like the spiritual master has has to tell you to do these things. And we should know. This is the practice of regulated principle. It's mentioned in the purport. To practice the regulative principles of bhakti yoga, one should under the guidance of an expert spiritual master. Of course, we're all guided by Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada is the founder of Acharya and he gave us the principles of Bhakti Yoga. He gave us the morning program. So, we should, under the guidance of the expert spiritual master, follow certain principles. And then Prabhupada describes, rise early in the morning, take bath, enter the temple, offer prayers, chant Hare Krishna, collect flowers to offer to the deity, cook foodstuffs to offer to the deity, take prasadam, and so on. There are various rules and regulations which one should follow, and one should constantly hear Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam from pure devotees. This practice can help anyone rise to the level of love of God and then he is sure of his progress into the spiritual kingdom of God. This practice under the rules and regulations with the direction of a spiritual master will surely bring one to the stage of love of God. Right? So the regulative principles of bhakti yoga what we're supposed to do. We're not able to fix our mind without deviation, but if we follow this bhakti yoga, do these rules and follow the, what we call vaidhi sadhana bhakti, all right, according to the different rules and regulations, then the result will be, was described in the verse, what's the result? Purification, love of God. It will develop a desire to attain Krishna. In this way, develop a desire to attain Krishna. Krishna says in the text, develop a desire to attain Krishna by following the regulative principles of Bhakti Yoga. We'll get that desire, right? So that's it. The set, the step down. We're going down the ladder, right? Then text number 10 continues. Text number 10. If you cannot practice the regulations of bhakti yoga, then just try to work for me, because by working for me, you will come to the perfect stage. Right? Work for Krishna. You cannot do bhakti yoga, then do karma yoga. Try just work for Krishna. It can be karma, mishra, it can karma mishra bhakti or bhakti mishra karma, <laughs> right? Working for Krishna and we'll come to the perfect stage. Now, actually we find most of our, more of our congregation are more on this level rather than on the level of bhakti yoga. Because to get people to just do bhakti yoga every day, that's a challenge. It's difficult for people. 
worship the deity every day, every day get up early, every day do all these things. They, they have a difficult time to do that. Now, because, as we say, congregation, people are not living in the temple. And different things happen when we're outside the temple, you know, different things can disturb your program. You can try to be regulated, but there's always problems, there's always some difficulties. So, work for Krishna, and the result will be, what will be the result of working for Krishna? Purification. Come to the perfect stage. Come to the stage of? Devotional service. Right, we'll come to the stage of devotional service. You will come to the stage of devotional service, that's the perfect stage devotional service. Work for Krishna. But as you say, we get purified. Yes, we will. Working for Krishna. How do we work for Krishna? What do you do? All that you do, do it for Krishna. All that you offer and give away, do it for Krishna. Yeah. Right? All, austeri all that you do, all that you eat, all that you give, offer and give away, all austerities you may perform, everything. Do it for Krishna. So this is, uh, and, and in, in the purport Prabhupada refers to that 55th verse of the 11th chapter. How to work for Krishna, he said, Prabhupada said, how to do this work has already been explained in the 55th verse of the 11th chapter. Right? Mat karma krin mat paramo mat bhakta sangha vargita, like that. Remember, we explained the five items working for Krishna, devotion, in the room. and then Prabhupada says also one should be sympathetic to the propagation of Krishna consciousness. There are many devotees who are engaged in the propagation of Krishna consciousness. And they require help. So even if one cannot directly practice the regulative principles of bhakti yoga, then you can try to help people who are doing bhakti yoga. Every endeavor requires land, capital, organization and labor. Just as in business one requires a place to stay, some capital to use, some labor, some organization to expand. So the same is required in the service of Krishna. The only difference is that in materialism one works for sense gratification. The same work, however, can be performed for the satisfaction of Krishna's devotee like that. So you can see very clearly the progression, right? Progression or digression if you like, because we're taking it from the top. So we have like that, the de progression to, and first of all, fix your mind without deviation. You can't do that, but then practice the regulated principles of bhakti yoga, and then this way will gradually develop a desire to attain Krishna. And we can't do the bhakti yoga, maybe you're not very good getting up in the morning and chanting your rounds, also unsteady and like that. And so then, work for Krishna, working for Krishna, and you, gradually you will come to the stage of devotional service. And if you're not able to do that, then what should you do? We can read text 11 and 12. Can someone read? Yes, yes, Maharaj. If, if however, we are unable to work in the in this consciousness of me, uh, then try to act giving up all results of birth and try to be self-situated. Translation.
Could you read that again, Prabhu? If, however, you are unable to work in this consciousness of me, then try to act giving up all results of work and try of your work and try to be self situated. Okay. Uh, do I read the purport also, Maharaj? Yeah, you could do. Yes. Purport. Uh, it may be that one is unable to even uh, uh, unable even to sympathize with the activities of Krishna consciousness because of social, familial, or religious considerations, or because of some other impediments. If one attaches himself directly to the activities of Krishna consciousness, there may be many uh, there may be objections from uh, family members or so many other difficulties for one who has such a problem it is advised that he sacrifice the accumulated result of his activities to some good cause such procedures are described in the vedic rules there are many descriptions of sacrifices and special functions of punya or special work in which the result of one's previous action may be applied thus one may gradually become elevated to the state of knowledge. It is also found that when one who is, who is not even interested in the activities of Krishna consciousness gives charity to some hospital or some other social institution, he gives up the hard-earned results of his activities. That is also recommended here because by the practice of giving up the fruits of one's activities, one is sure to purify his mind gradually. And in that purified state of mind, one becomes uh, able to understand Krishna consciousness. Yes, right. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes, good. So, we understand, you know, that it's uh, not uncommon, unfortunately. You get some people in this situation, maybe, maybe it's the lady, the lady's a devotee, but the husband's really against it. The husband, no, don't get involved with that. They just want your money, they would say like that, they'll take your money, don't go there, don't have anything to do with this. So, what to do? You're not able to give to Krishna, then you're encouraged to give some other place, maybe some mundane welfare institution. And in this way, you get some, you'll be able to cultivate some detachment. But it's not spiritual, of course. If you give charity for some mundane welfare institution, that's material. Okay. It's not actually, there's no spiritual benefit there. But the, 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 the result is you do get some detachment. You get a little detached from the money by giving charity. So that's one level of purification. Is it clear? Yeah? All right, and then text number 12. Someone else can read text 12. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Shreya hi jnanam abhyasaj jnana dhyanam vishishyate dhyanat karma pala tyagas tyagat shantir anantaram Translation, if you cannot take to this practice, then engage yourself in the cultivation of knowledge. Better than knowledge, however, is meditation. And better than meditation is renunciation of the fruits of action. For by such renunciation, one can attain peace of mind. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Yes, so that's that's the lowest stage, and that this is that's an indirect process. It's not direct. It's an indirect process. The, you know, it's going to take some time to advance here. But the other three process, other three levels, which we've shown in the diagram, they are the topmost. They are direct. All right, so these are the different stages of devotion. You can see the, the bottom, you know, you have things like following Varnashram Dharma or something like that. Per performance of duty, meditation, renunciation. 
that's all on the bottom level. And then above that, then working for Krishna, sacrificing the results for Krishna, results of your work. And above that, bhakti yoga, regulated principles of bhakti yoga. And above that, the topmost stage, fix your mind without deviation. And so Krishna was showing, he started at the topmost level, but he understood not everybody can do that. So he comes down and down and down, right? <laughs> he came to the lowest stage and, and the indirect process. Okay. Oh, did I read this? Yeah, we read this, all right. This practice can help anyone come to the level of love of God. Okay. And then we will come to the last section here of this twelfth chapter, qualities that endear one to Krishna. Hearing about the pure devotees, so what are the qualities which we need to develop to become a good devotee? So here is some qualities. Hmm? Oh, Krishna. Nirahankara means I am Krishna's servant. And then someone can read the next quality, Shami. Krishna. Shami means excuse. A devotee is especially attacked by the demons. Because Prahlad Maharaj was a devotee, even his father was an enemy. What to speak of others? So a devotee will have to meet so many enemies. We have the example of the life of Lord Jesus Christ. When he was being killed by others, he said to excuse them, God, they do not know what they are doing. That is the devotee's position. Shami, always excusing. We have to learn this. Uh, yes, an important quality, right? It, uh, qualities of a sadhu or qualities here of devotee for excuse people or being forgiving even people do wrong so Prabhupada quotes Lord Jesus Christ here and you can think of other people like this who tolerated people were not nice to them and did bad things to them but they tolerated what are some other examples from the scriptures who? Haridas Thakur? Yes, right. Yes, Haridas Thakur. What happened to him? Maharaji, Maharaji, what happened to him? He was whipped in 22 marketplaces. Yes, and did he have any and grudges against the people? No, Maharaji. And to blame him, actually, a prostitute had been sent to blame in the society. He also excluded those persons. Yes, he prayed till he prayed that the two men who were beating him would not suffer for beating him. So he didn't have grudge against them. All right, so that, that kind of tolerance, that kind of forgiving nature has to be there. And as you said, Lord Nityananda, Lord Nityananda was hit on the head when he, they approached Jagai and Madai. And so he was struck on the head with the, their wine pot and blood was coming from his head. But Lord Nityananda prayed to Lord Chaitanya that, no, you must be merciful, don't punish them. That in this age, you must be merciful. So, forgiving. Huh? Can you see Ambarish Maharaj also? Maharaj Ambarish also, yes, he was threatened by who? Durvasa Muni, and uh, he didn't do anything actually, the Krishna came and protected him. Correct, so he, yes. He, he didn't okay. take his... Okay, so forgiving, forgiving, excusing people is an important quality. And the next quality, someone reads, Santushta. Santushta. So if Krishna desires that I should suffer like this, why should I bother? 
let me suffer. There are many verses to support this. That the Anukam Ham Sushami Shamano Munjana E Vatma Krita. When a devotee is put into distress, he thinks it is God's kindness that He is giving me little pen, some heart, although I should have suffered more. I wish. So, do you think like this, Maharaji, when you're suffering? Not always, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Yeah, generally we don't, right? We're thinking, oh, why am I suffering? Why I've got this? Uh, uh, yeah. You know, past deeds I am suffering. I should, a devotee should think like that. A devotee should think that it's Krishna's kindness that he's giving me. We should think I'm meant to suffer more, right? I'm such a rascal, I should suffer more, but Krishna is only giving me a little suffering. <laughs> so why? We have to try to see the suffering, the difficulties which we go through in relation to our Krishna consciousness. So being, uh, having this mood not not to be bitter or not just understand that this is my karma that uh, i'm responsible for the suffering it's nobody else's fault it's my own fault so let me suffer there's a nice example in the chaitanya charitamrita there was one brahmana called vasudev and he had worms were eating his body his body was filled with leprosy and he had worms which were eating his flesh but if a worm would fall out of his body he would pick it up and put it back into his body so that it could continue eating his flesh so he he was like that he just had that mood let me suffer and of course lord chaitanya came there and lord chaitanya embraced this leopard vasudev and when Lord Chaitanya embraced him, immediately the leprosy vanished from his body. And the, the leper Vasudev said to Lord Chaitanya, he said, Oh, he said, now it will be easy for me to fall into Maya. Now you've given me a strong, healthy body. I, I may want to enjoy the material world again. I may fall into Maya. So Lord Chaitanya said, yes, so now you have to constantly chant the Hare Krishna mantra and you should preach Krishna consciousness. And then that way you'll never fall into Maya. All right, so that example is there. So these are two important qualities. Here's some more. Yeah, somebody please read. First one, Drida Nischaya. Means he believes in the word of Krishna. A devotee believes that I am nothing to do except to surrender to Krishna. That then all my business is done. <laughs> right? Do you believe that? All your business is done when you surrender to Krishna? Uh, sometimes, uh, Maharaj. Yes, good. Yes. We have nothing to do but surrender to Krishna. <laughs> Of course, we are, we are thinking we have so many other things to do, but our real business. Okay, and Arpita Mano Budhir. Someone read. Arpita Mano Budhir. Mind and intelligence are always focused on the lotus feet of Krishna. You come to the temple, observe that to Krishna, and always think of him. This, that is the highest, topmost yoga system. Therefore, deity worship is very important. If you are engaged in deity worship, you always see the forms of Krishna and Radharani. And if you always think of Krishna and Radharani within your heart, then you become the topmost yoga. Uh -huh. So, are you worshipping the deity? Yes, Do You offer arti sometimes? Yes. Worship the deity. The, the pujari is the most fortunate person because he's directly serving Krishna. So deity worship is very powerful to help us to purify the mind, to fix the mind on Krishna. 
and then anapeksha. Anapeksha, neutral, just see. When I went to America, I went with 40 rupees. This, the Sumati Moradji gave me a ticket and I had only 40 rupees. That 40 rupees could not be spent there. Then when I was disembarking, I told the captain, Captain Pandit, Pandya, I have not a single dollar with me. Will you purchase one seat of my books? One set of my books? So Swami was, what is your price? $16. He paid me $20. Jai. You see Prabhupada distributing books. As soon as he got mm -hmm. to America, he didn't get off the boat and he sold a set of his Bhagavatams, which he brought all the way from India for $20. So, so the Captain Pandya, he was so impressed, you know, he'd seen Prabhupada on the boat and he saw Prabhupada how he was very devoted and very religious and how he would do things. So Captain Pandya was impressed with him. So he bought a set of the books and paid him $20. So the, the example is very important and it impressed the captain so much so that he bought a set of the books. All right. And then next one. Supa Supa. When I was in Boston, I was thinking, I have come here. How will they receive me? As soon as I say no meat eating, no illicit sex, no gambling, no intoxication, immediately they will reply, please go home, don't preach here. All right. So for one year there was no success and then I was always going to the shipping company to ask. When does your ship next return? So the manager said, Swamiji, you are always inquiring, but you never go. I said, yes. When I am too frustrated, I come here to ask you. Then I go back again. Let me see two months more. It was going like that. Nobody was there with me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is an example of Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> Understand? So Prabhupada said he was, uh, when I am too frustrated, so Prabhupada was feeling frustration sometimes there. But he did not give up. He continued to tolerate that and to continue to go on. So that was important. Nobody was there with him, he was alone. Well, naturally, he'd feel in a foreign country. So naturally, at his age as well, in his 70s, so he'd be thinking to go back to India, and very difficult. But somehow he continued. Okay, right? And then, next quality, Aniketa. Automatically, Aniketa, there was no place to live, no money. Sanyas means Aniketa. Now we have 100 temples, but Krishna doesn't allow me to stay more than eight days. I'm dependent on Krishna. If he allows, Hare Krishna. Mm. <laughs> Aniketa, no place, no where to, no home. And so sannyasi is meant to be like that, right? No home. But then Prabhupada said, we have so many temples. But couldn't stay any one place. So, here's the exercise now. Pairs, in pairs, you can do it. Ask the students to take some time to individually reflect on various types of suffering they undergo. What has given them pain and what is giving them distress at the moment? Jot down a few notes or make a list, make a list, right? <laughs> a lot of things giving us pain. No, oh, maybe you could say, well, no money or my husband or my girlfriend or something like that, you know, giving me a lot of trouble. Uh, what, what's the pain, you know? My car, my job, so many different things can be there. And then we want draw on their own experience identifies ways 
identify ways of successfully dealing with certain types of distress. What do they do? What do they do in terms of mental or menial attitude and behavior, or mental attitude and behavior? So identify the distress and then how to deal with this distress. What should be our proper mindset and behavior and share our experiences. The different reasons for keeping in mind different reasons for being put into distress. And, and try to relate to the verse, to these verses and purport. and identify at least one way in which they could deal with the distress. Is it possible? Can we do this? This is the last part of the chapter. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Huh? Yes, Guru Maharaj. So pairs, you want to work in pairs, and uh, identify different types of suffering, and then how are you going to deal with it, this distress? What's your solution? in terms of mental attitude and behavior and some experiences you may have. That's also very nice if you've got some experience, what you did when you were in difficulty. All right? We describe this as inner life experience. Hmm. So this is practical application, personal application. Yeah, just take five, ten minutes to try to do something on this and we'll get your feedback.
Gurumaraj, we are all coming back. Sorry, it took a, a few extra minutes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I guess everyone is back, Guru. Uh huh. All right. So, uh, did you identify uh -huh. some some items which cause distress? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh Maharaj, this I would like to tell, uh, like before coming to Krishna consciousness, if anybody is scolding me or anybody is telling something bad, like in office generally it happens, they will do a lot of politics and they will tell something bad about us. So that time, or if anybody is scolding, that time I used to feel very bad. I will like, I'll be, I'll always my mind will be thinking only, hey, how can he to like, or she can tell us like that. I will feel very bad. Okay. But after coming to Krishna consciousness, I realized, okay, whatever, if I mean, anybody is telling me something bad, that is because of my ego i'm feeling bad it's just uh, like my past karma which is getting exhausted and i feel like because of krishna's mercy i'm getting little only i'm not getting that much like i i, I should get i'm getting like very little because of krishna's mercy and i am i was with the dayanidhi prabhu he also shared one a very good uh, good experience like whenever he used to preach some people will not understand some people will not understand they will think okay this uh, is con are like fraud people only they are just cheating us this and that so that time actually like it pains us a lot it pains us a lot but uh, our motto is to preach like how nityananda prabhu also like he went to jagai and mother he got scolding but he got hurt also in his head but still he he wanted to preach so our motto is we will preach to everybody but sometimes people does not understand and it it like we, we suffer we it pains a lot uh, Maharaj, that's what I would say. Okay, very good. And do you have a solution? How did you deal with it? Yeah, earlier, like, I was feeling very bad, but now if I'm getting scoldings or if anybody is telling me something, I feel, okay, let it get this, like, like let my past karma gets exhausted. That's what I will feel like. I feel, okay, because of Krishna's mercy, I'm, like, I'm really getting very little. It's just a shadow. It's not actually, like, what to say. It's, it's not actually the real suffering. I'm getting very little. That's what I feel. You're just getting a token suffering, right? Uh, Your suffering has been reduced by the mercy of Krishna. Yes, my Lord. Right. Okay, very good. So you have a Krishna conscious understanding of the difficulty, the distress. All right. Thank you, Maharaji. Anyone else like to contribute? I can, Maharaj. May I? Please. Yes, so Maharaj, I will uh, speak about my daughter who was very, very ill a few years ago. And um, we just didn't know what was happening to her. And she was in London in university. Then she went to the hospital and the doctors didn't know what was happening with her. And she was in a very, very bad state. And it had just happened that year we went to Jagannath Puri and we came back to Hong Kong. And the very next day we get a phone call that she's very ill and we are putting her on a ventilator. You please come. So we all rushed. And uh, she was admitted near the manor in the hospital uh, at Watford. And, um, you know, every day we used to go to the temple. We just didn't know what was happening with her. Nobody actually in that whole NHS knew what was happening with her. But, uh, you know, every time, you know, everything was just because we didn't have an answer. I realized in this situation, uh, Previously, also, I have had issues in in, uh, in my family, and I would react in a different way. But when it when when this situation was in front of us, when I progress as in my Krishna consciousness, we handle this situation more, much more calmly. And every time I felt that you know, don't worry, Jagannath, he was telling me I am there with you, you know. And after eight weeks, uh, five weeks of ICU, she came out. And uh, she was totally you not know, an 18-year-old kid. She was like an 80-year-old person sitting on a chair who could move, speak, or anything. And in, in the next three weeks, the doctor told she will take six weeks to get better. And I was in London staying at someone's place. And, you know, things were just not happening. But, you know, in this whole situation, I felt that Krishna was there throughout with her. In her, when she was in her, like, she was uh, unconscious. They had to make her unconscious because of the trips. She actually saw Harinam and Kirtan on the streets. Uh, you know, she was listening to, she says, Mommy, at night in my dreams, I was listening to Harinam, uh, Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And that was like, you know, uh, it was something that she realized. And what we realized is that, you know, no matter the situation happened, but Krishna was there with us all the time. The temple head pujari came from the manor to bless her because she was not getting better. And uh, you know, after one year, 
any child, any uh, young kids of my friends who tell me, oh, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in Krishna, I actually show them my older daughter's picture of her being sick and her standing in front of them. I said, this is miracle and this is where Krishna is, you know. So they, they actually realize and she wrote her own blog also and a lot of uh, appreciation she got for this. And what we think that, you know, Krishna looks at a bigger picture. And the thing is that we were thinking that it's better it happened that time. What if it would happen at COVID time? Maybe she would not survive because the situation was so bad during COVID time. So I think Krishna works in different ways and this is our realization. Oh, wonderful. Oh, thank you very much. Very nice. Very moving. Oh, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Anyone else like to follow this? Yes, any of the men have any, you don't have any distress? The men don't suffer distress? <laughs> Supreme Mataji and uh, Raspberry Prabhu have just unmuted. Prabhu, you like to share something? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, we have been going through some of the tough times, uh, multiple yeah. things happening in our life. So, so actually, uh, it was just when I uh, I got married and uh, at that time I became a little more serious in Krishna consciousness. Actually, I have had a Krishna conscious background right from my childhood, but I was not very uh, serious into it. But when I became serious just after marriage, uh, you know, when I wanted to become more serious, at that time, uh, you know, I had my daughter, then uh, uh, then we, when uh, she was diagnosed with some special needs and I was I was feeling very devastated because uh, I'm just uh, surrendered to Krishna and he's giving me so many sufferings, one behind the other. So we have had quite an incident in our life. We even lost our son in between and uh, so... We, so uh, when I turn back and uh, uh, see, uh, even though she's been branded uh, like that, you know, with some difficulties, especially, mm -hmm. but uh, right, right from the time she got into problems, I kind of realized that all my anarthas or my difficult uh, difficulties which I have been having um, uh, throughout my life, everything became uh, milder. I was a very impatient person. Uh, tolerance was very nil in me and. Uh, Patience and tolerance slowly started coming in me. Sometimes even devotees say that uh, oh, you're such a patient person. I find it very ironical because I was just never like that before and uh, patience and tolerance are slowly coming uh, in a better way in me. And, uh, and even as far as my daughter is concerned, uh, uh, even though it might find like a burden, but uh, she doesn't say anything other than Krishna. She knows nothing other than Krishna. One Prabhuji out here was saying that uh, um, very lucky for her in one sense that she will never do Vaishnava Prat. She's always chanting Krishna's name. So it's either Brahma Samhita or it's the Vaishnava Bhajans or it is always chanting the Lord's name. So in one sense, it's a big blessing that, you know, we get to see her and she doesn't uh, you know all her mood is in some other world always in krishna's uh, thoughts so we are not so very much in krishna's thoughts so sometimes it's like a reminder always in front of my eyes that you know i should be thinking of the lord always so oh, very nice thank you one, very much one more thought comes maharaj uh, someone was referring that uh, the mood of chaitanya mahaprabhu was something like this uh, when he was in that uh, uh, ecstasy like uh, he used to uh, constantly chant the Lord's name and those kind of things. So uh, it, this reminds us something that we should be in that mood uh, whenever we, I don't know whether we'll be able to achieve that particular thing, but that this is a reminder for us, that's kind of uh, thing that we see. Yes, right. Yeah, we want to be in that mood, to be always Krishna conscious, somehow bring the mind back, fix on Krishna. And we can overcome all the difficulties. You know, it's very nice you have so much faith in Krishna, you could take full shelter. Thank you very much. All right, any other, anyone else wants to contribute here? Okay, so I think we'll finish off here today and uh, we'll be back tomorrow and we'll have revision tomorrow and we'll 
finish off the twelfth chapter as well and then have revision on what we covered tomorrow, right? So tomorrow should be the final lesson and then you can prepare for your the uh, closed book test coming up the next again week. All right? So thank you all very much for your participation. Srila Prabhupada. His Holiness Bhakti Vikna Vinash Narasimha Maharaj Ki. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Haribo. Ah.